Hey everybody, welcome to a brand new uh, Film Music Media interview. I'm uh, here sitting with the amazing Matt Bowen and, and Chris Leonards. Uh, we're going to be focusing specifically on their collaboration. This is going to be a spotlight on their uh, collaborative process as co-composers. And uh, guys, thank you so much for, for joining me. It's so great to see you, both of you. Love it. Thanks for having us. Always great to see you, man. Good to see yeah. you. I got the boys boys over here. So I know, good. that's right. <laughs> So, yeah, so, I mean, we've, uh, for anyone who's listening slash watching, you know, we can, you guys can go, you can go back into Film Music Media's archives to find all these different interviews with Matt and, and Chris separately. But right now we're going to focus on your, you guys together and kind of the collaborative process as co-composers, especially Matt's journey, kind of starting as an additional composer and kind of working up uh, to you guys now co-composing Gen V. So I just kind of want to kick it off and start off. How did you guys come to to know each other, to work together? I and mean, what was the origin story for you two? I'm curious. <laughs> Yeah, you want to you want to take this. You want to talk about Rob Cairns or yeah, you, you want to talk about Rob Cairns or should I talk about Rob Cairns? You are, I want to hear you talk about Rob Cairns. Um, so I would happily talk. So Rob Cairns is a dear old friend of mine and a dear old friend of Matt's, and I think we both knew him separately first. And he's a fantastic, fantastic composer. Um, he's probably one of the best writers I've ever met, um, and just sort of a mad scientist of genius in, com in terms of like sound and just like just production. Yeah, he's just genius. And we, you know, and I, I we've worked together a little bit. Uh, and and he um, he uh, besides he he does the Bachelor and all that stuff, which is like you know so massively you know he's like he's so talented he should be doing giant movies yeah. um I will say that without hesitation um but he's also just the sweetest guy um but he also has amazing amazing people who who work with him and 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 in the old days uh i think i collaborated with with rob probably back in the like late 90s uh i think on an abc oh, wow. show he 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 did a little, a little additional music for me on a on a on a show and then i think uh, I did some music for him on an ABC show and and he's just so good and so whenever quite a few times in in the past you know couple decades I guess um decade and a half when I when I was like oh man I need somebody who can really make stuff sound good um who's got great taste and great instincts besides just being able to write um and you're too busy and so um he mentioned Matt who was working for him and, you know, and so we started, I I'm trying to think what the first thing we did together was you probably Marmaduke. Were, Marmaduke. Marmaduke. Hey. Thing, uh, yeah. Where, where, <laughs> where Matt uh, lent some amazing stuff uh, and talent to, to, to that one. Um, and, and it, it was immediate from, from the get go that we had not only similar uh, I think tastes and, and what, usually what Matt thinks is cool, I think is cool and vi hopefully vice versa. Um, and, um, and also Matt plays a lot of the instruments that I don't play. Um, he plays tons of instruments and I barely can sort of chop on some of them, but, but in all fairness, like it, it's, it's a great thing. So we started working back then and, you know, there was a bunch of movies that, you know, I know, uh, Ride Along 2, there was a couple of, uh, uh, great cues in there that Matt produced and, and, uh, co-wrote a couple things and 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 a bunch of different things so so when the boy it is a long way ago and then i'll let you talk about rob and how brilliant he is but um but when it came time to get into stuff with the boys um i i sort of put together a band because eric Kripke wanted it to feel like a garage band. Um, and so we, uh, Dara, who was working for me at the time and Matt and Alex Bornstein. And, and we just started like, we basically put together the boys band and started doing jam sessions to come up with the right sounds and the right amps. And we went shopping and bought crappy broken instruments and did all that. And that was, you know, whatever, six years ago, five years ago. And, um, and not only did that work out great, um, in terms of developing the sound for the boys and making sure we got that, you know, that really grungy vibe and, and we could all sort of take turns playing instruments. But um, but also, I think Matt and I developed a, a, a sort of a working uh, partnership where, you know, we he became 
you know, integral to this to that score. And then when it was time to, uh, you know, he co-composed a couple episodes as well as doing a ton of additional music for season three of the boys. So when it was time for um, Gen V to come up, especially, you know, because they were sort of on top of each other. Plus, we were still at the end of covid um, um, and he he already had a, developed a great relationship with Eric, who uh, who I went to college with. And and so it just felt really natural that like, OK, well, we should just do this thing together um, because that's kind of what we've been doing, you know, all along. And yeah. and now that everyone knows and trusts Matt as much as as much as me, then it's you know, it became like sort of like, well, this makes the perfect sense um to go into the spinoff with with us as, as you know co-composers and i think it really that's the way it sort of worked out and it was it was genius and you know and obviously we've developed a band and a, a bunch of partnerships and 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 have have our band for the for gen v as well and he'll probably tell you about that but i'll pass off to you now yeah tell me matt from your perspective what was uh your journey <laughs> yeah it, uh, well that was that was more or less it yeah i mean it was marmaduke was the first one um Rob called to let me know that he had passed my name along. And I remember him saying, I better not lose you to this guy. <laughs> Shit. Yeah. Sorry, Rob. So, yeah. So Chris, here's your, here's the chance for you to. <laughs> to apologize to Rob. Yeah. I'm very, um, very, very. But yeah, I mean, as Chris said, there's, there's, um, yeah, I, the reason I moved to LA was actually to produce uh, records for, for bands. It was uh, composing wasn't even on my radar um just because i kind of didn't know what 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 it looked like mm. um so i i started working for my first three or four years was working on you know major major label full-length albums as an engineer so that was kind of my background and and with you know emphasis in 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 the in the sound of stuff and then figure out the writing later um and so with that being my focus i think when when Chris and I work together. Be curious to get Chris's take on this. I feel like we we ha we have very different writing voices, but we have very similar producing voices, and so it's yeah. it's very easy for us to work together because it can it'll sound similar, but and it's actually you know our, our cues will complement each other because we're we're kind of bringing things that the other one might not bring conceptually, but our our production sensibilities are are just totally in line um and so i think that's why just even from that very first project it it was it, you know started working together and started working together a lot yeah. so i think yeah i'll skip over all he he did it he did a great job with the chronology of it all but mm -hmm. um yeah and then just when when we got to to gen v it was i mean the the timing couldn't have been better even even the fact that it was after season three of the boys because as he mentioned right when he brought my name up by the time after season three of the boys um they're not saying that you know who you know if it's after season one yeah. and they're like great let's do the spinoff it was after season three and there was a lot of meetings and a lot of trust by that point um uh um so it just it it just felt natural and it really really was natural i mean it, it was um yeah yeah absolutely well i'm chris i'm curious from your perspective you know i think a lot of people might be you know especially new people coming into the industry like what is that relationship between a composer and additional composer so rewinding you know early in matt's career when you, as the boss as the co lead composer when you're building your music team and you already mentioned you can't you you kind of got you know gelled with matt and but what do you look for when you're bringing someone on like that because it is you are essentially, Matt, you're working on Chris's music. And now you get to, you know, say, you, know, you mentioned you have both different writing styles. So I'm curious, uh, Chris, from your point of view, what is the point of view of the person bringing on an additional composer? And is this even, I've had some composers tell me that it's not like a mentorship, like it's no, you're, we're working together, we're co workers, and we're collaborators. And we're but is it are you, is it a mentorship? Are you kind of teaching the ropes? Are you are you kind of giving a safety net to Matt to learn and to kind of fail and and learn and in a comfortable spot? I'm curious what how you see that all coming together. Um, I mean, I I don't think musically there was a mentorship because um, mm -hmm. Matt was already great at, at writing. I think maybe maybe there's just because I've been doing it longer than him. I think there might be a little bit. Maybe you know, I hopefully I've been somewhat of a mentor in terms of the business side of it probably um and maybe that kind of world um just because i you know i started 
earlier and and that was that um but i think in general it's more of a partnership and i think you know i do think one of the things that i have noticed that are that i really started doing when i got started getting busy probably in the you know late 2000s and realized that i wasn't you know the, the schedules were shrinking and it became really apparent that you can't do TV and movies and video games and lots of stuff without having, you know, a team that can support when schedules change or when edits change or things like that. Um, and at first, I think everyone's natural instinct is like, oh, man, I got to I got to find somebody that that can write like I do. Mm -hmm. And and I think my natural instinct was probably to try that as well at first. And then I sort of it was right around the time of like probably horrible bosses and and um um uh, and and think like a man and maybe some other ones where i started and 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 um and and i'm trying to think what tv shows were around there but I, but i think it 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 kind of became really apparent to me that that actually is not the right way to look at it you want to have similar tastes and similar working attitudes but i actually was like i actually get a lot more I think everybody gets a lot more out of the relationship when there's stuff that I'm not good at, that the people that are yeah. on my team are good at. And I really do look at it as, cause Hans kind of does that really well too. And, and I, I almost look at it as a little bit of a, of a record producer slash band idea, which is, yes. you know, you don't yeah. need two Eddie Van Halen's you need one and you need and then you need Alex and you need you know you don't you know you need people who can do what they do and they have to agree on what the final outcome and be able to bring that together and 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 do that but I have actually you know over the past 10 years definitely have have gotten to the point where like I specifically go after people who can do things that better than I can in yeah. a certain area and then I you know, hopefully that I learn from them, they learn from me. Um, I think it's much more of a of that kind of approach. Um, but I will say, because I have to give a shout out to, you know, to both Basil Apollodorus and Michael Kamen, um, who, you know, they were my bosses and they they both were such generous uh mentors, but also like they, you know, I would have no career if Basil didn't, I wasn't sitting with him and and Bobby at lunch when they told the executive on the movie he was doing that he should listen to my music. And yeah. and sometime when they couldn't afford Basil, they should hire me. Um, and that led to me getting tempted into some TV shows. Um, and I think one of the things that that taught me early on was that if you're going to have people working for you and then concurrently with you, you, you have to give that, I, you know, they gave me a, a path to the point where I could no longer work for Basil because I was so busy on my own mm -hmm. and that was a good thing. And so I very early on in my career always tried to look at this in a way that said, well, if they're going to work really hard for me and get me out of tons of jams and help me write a billion different things and, 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 and sound really good. How do I, how do I pay that back and how do I make it? So it seems fair and it can't just be the paycheck. It, it, you know, I need to be able to help people with their career, the way people help me with mine. And that's why, you know, like I, I very proudly look back on like, I'm like all my, all my family is are brilliant. It's Philip yeah. White and Dara and Alex Bornstein and Matt and Jess Straub and all these, you know, people who have been, you know, part of my world who now, you know, it's it was really important to me. Like, how do I get them get their careers to to the next level as well, whether it be helping to find an agent or, you know, or introducing them to producers or when I can't do a gig, making sure that 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 you know that we that we find a way to see if they can take that gig and and i feel like it's it's served me so well it's very selfish because i mean i'm glad to, i'm glad to help but it's definitely served me well because i still you know it's like dara's still helping out yeah on 
on as part of the boys family and 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 alex bornstein is you know working with me on a show and it's like it 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 creates this long-standing team thing where it's not like you're it's not just transactional it feels very much like a really cool band slash family and that's kind of what i think we ended up all being um but matt really took the the big step in the in the world of the boys and and Vought and Gen V and and sort of he and I are I would consider us absolutely you know you know co-producers of the sound and the vision of all of all of the whole you know V VCU um, and I think you know I think and everybody on the show knows that too I think that's great absolutely well Matt from your point of view like uh, when you came in. Did you say, oh, I'm going to use this opportunity to learn as much? Because you mentioned that you didn't, you know, came in as wanted to be a producer. Did you were like, I'm going to use this opportunity to learn as much as I can. Did you ever just corner Chris and be like, you know, teach me stuff? Or did you just was kind of no, observational yeah. sit around? You sit, you see how Chris handles meetings. You see how Chris handles producers and directors. And you just kind of then put your own stamp on it, how you would approach it. It's a little bit the latter. And it's also just his um, getting his feedback on my work whether i'm arranging or whether i'm you know i've taken a few cues just that feedback is it's like i'm going i'm getting my master's but i'm getting paid to do it it's you know yeah. it's incredible you know i i started working for chris it very admittedly long before i i should have like from a just a basic skill set um you know i i still remember <laughs> <laughs> the very first this is not a uh, this is not a great story for me to tell but the one of the first cues i wrote for marmaduke this is way back when and they said oh we got this orc session can you send us your midi and i sent the midi and um and you know that's because so they can turn it into sheet music and yeah. and my midi was a mess and there was no tempo map because i just decided to be all touchy-feely and the the cue was totally rubato and and that I sent the MIDI on like, um, let's just say a Monday and the orc session was like on a Thursday and I got a call on Tuesday. Like what is like, I think your tempo map didn't get exported. And I, I was, I was actually out of town. I was like, I, I don't know what to t I actually kind of don't know what you're asking. But so that, 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 that's where, when I started working with Chris. So yeah, I mean, the, I had so much to learn. I had technical, of course, uh, you know, how, how to, you know, handle, you know, meetings and interactions with directors and producers, but, but just, um, I mean, you, you mentioned when you asked Chris the question, you mentioned the safety net and that's like, that is everything when you yeah. are working for somebody like Chris. Um, it's just everything. It just clears your mind, you know, now that I'm on the other side and I have, uh, uh on some of these projects and I have that responsibility, I'm realizing, you know, I, don't, I wouldn't say I ever took it for granted, but I still didn't understand the, the scope of what it meant for, you know, Chris was, when Chris trusts you, he really trusts you. And that is a gift, but at the end of the day, it's his name is on the project and he, you know, he's not gonna, he's not gonna let anything get, go out unless it's great. And so fast forward to the boys no the the boys was just another like great let's let's let me let me see how i can help and i think uh not to get too philosophical but but you know one of the ways that i it was so creatively liberating is hey i'm gonna chris i'm gonna give you all my batshit crazy ideas and we're gonna see what sticks but this is your project so you're going to see, you know, but, but, you know, it, it, it's a good lesson for when, you know, if it is your own project to still, it's like almost, almost trick yourself into thinking, oh, this is somebody else's project. Let, let's just brainstorm in as reckless a way as possible. Um, so that, that was very freeing when we were trying to discover what the sound of the boys was. And I just remember I was a pig and slop. I had brought a lot of these instruments you see and up on that wall and I brought you know just about every stringed instrument I, I owned and we were just running around the studio just you know we were taking turns with who was in the tracking room and who was in the, the monitoring room and and just kind of you know opening his his piano up at sonic at sonic fuel and making weird sounds at the piano and I, and I was just I was just a pig and slop and and I didn't and when the dust started to settle, it was kind of like, oh, there's some, there's some 
magic there. Um, yeah. And I got to be, you know, I got to be a part of, of, of that, that, that kind of sound that was built. So um, just that alone, whether anything, whether that had gone one season and it ended and, and that was it, it would have absolutely been worth the experience because the most traditional way that you help somebody with the project is, um, you know, maybe themes are written or the first passes are approved and then you're brought on and it's kind of like, hey, he, here's here's the sound, ready, set, go. Um, and so I just remember thinking like, oh, this is this is such a gift to to have a window into the the before. Um, yeah, and then, I yeah, mean, that's there. I mean, uh, from an outsider's point of view, you know, I've been doing this now. I think for over like 13 years, like I stumbling into film music journalism. I remember going to Dark Delicacies and and meeting Chris for the first time. I think you were signing, oh God, I forgot what you were signing, but you had some score out on La La Land. And and I, I remember because I grew up, you know, listening to your stuff on Medal of Honor and then getting to kind of um come into move to LA and then like, you know get to meet you guys. And 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 when I started out doing this, you know, I'd talk to people like Dara or like, you know, people who would like help book all these interviews for me and now to sit and interview Dara or interview Matt like we're doing their solo things and you know whether you're doing it's a wonderful binge or tender bar you know it's like you guys have to, to be on the on the outside watching you guys your guys's career you know I have my separate career outside of this as well but just like in the past decade or so to see kind of the growth just not just as people but as artists and storytellers too and I think uh Chris you have been I mean you're that's why asking these questions feels weird to make it so like clinical and like you know like it's like it's a like a corporation or something but you guys are family it is like every time I've been to Sonic Fuel or I talk to Tim or I talk to Chris, it's just it's like this love of family and even when I'm at RCP and talking to Hans or all this it's like a family it's like everything is like pulled together and and I think that's just unique because we are telling stories and you're telling these awesome thing I mean we get to, you know you guys get to work on the most you know, coolest shit in the, in the world like it's like the boys to me is like the way you do I think superheroes I know like people say superhero fatigue and, and Marvel and DC have these kind of identity crises but like I think television was such the perfect format for the boys and it's so much more than just you know it's a satire it's a it's a commentary it's social commentary and it has all these things so I want to jump into that world uh, you know, we just you just finished season three, season four. I know you guys are in the weeds now. You know, Eric had a variety of interviews said he didn't give a date for season four, but says, you know, we're in music and post right now. So I'm sure you guys are, uh, you know, up to here, like, in work. But um, I want to talk about Gen, uh, Gen V. And so maybe I want to start off, like, how has, I guess, how how has the boys evolved over across three seasons? How has that score shaped and molded, changed with the characters, with the plot? Uh, the sound has it changed at all and when you guys started on gen v you know it is in the world of the boys but how did you approach it was it how close did you want it to be how adjacent to the boys was it how different did you want to make it and i'm just curious what were those kind of how did you navigate doing a spinoff series after doing three seasons of the boys well chris you want you want to talk about the I'll, evolution of the yeah i'll start on that seasons. and then i'll sort of hand off to that because i think i think the the evolution on the boys has been really interesting because we definitely in season one uh started with two very distinct kinds of music yeah and there because the audience was learning and so you they knew about our the 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 seven and everybody the way as much as the rest the rest anybody watching it the first time so so there was what would we, we would at the time consider like superhero music, Vought propaganda, superhero music, which was much more coming from the world of, you know, Marvel and, mm -hmm. and coming from that, you know, playing into the stereotypes um, of that. And then there were our heroes, which is Butcher and the boys who are not superheroes who are like, scrappy and gritty and nasty just like that part of the music and then you know and then you get to you know the middle of season one and all of a sudden homelander crashes the plane and the horns start bending and then all of a sudden all of that music starts to come a little closer and so by the end of season one now everything was starting to get a little warped and messed up and then by the time we got to season two 
once we knew people and now we knew you know there was emotion behind you know uh butcher and becca and there was uh you know huey and starlight and all like so there was all this uh, there was stuff that wasn't there at the beginning that all developed in season one and now you get to season two and there's this whole other thing with like you know stormfront and there's like nazi history and all kinds of stuff so that all starts to come together so it very distinct the sound of season one was much more segmented and everything sort of came together and blew up in season two with a lot more emotion um and then what i think happened in season three when the soups got you know they got the compound you know the 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 compound v and or the you know the temp v and um and then also just the introduction of soldier boy and all of that you know there's really there really became a uh, from Eric's point of view, there became a need to be, as he, I think, as I think he's called is, is just much more realistic in terms of like, he, he wanted very little uh, of the music to feel like movie music um, anymore, which at the beginning there was still like, we wanted to let everyone know is, like, Oh, it's starting off. It's a superhero show, but then yeah. we, it's not really the superheroes you you know and by the end now he he i think the characters have become so deep and real mm -hmm. you know when you really get down and see what uh you know what the backstories and 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 when becca died i mean all of this stuff it it all comes everyone there's so much more connection with the audience and the characters that often eric's notes and responses are always like I don't want to, I don't want to notice you pushing me. Yeah. I just want subconscious. I want to be inside the head of the characters, but I don't want you to tell me what to feel or think. Uh, most of the time um, I want it to be sort of very, very transparent and, and, and gritty and, and, and warped and messed up and it, because everything keeps getting weirder and weirder. Um, so that's gets us to the end of, of, of season three and then now you've got that unhinged moment at the end where the violin starts warping, playing the Homelander violin theme. And now all of a sudden you're like, oh shit, where's this going next? And then it turns out we've got to now go to 20 something year old, eight, late teen, 20 something year olds who want to be superheroes in our world where People know that now that everything's all okay. Um, and that led us to a really interesting new starting point um, where we kind of didn't know exactly what that was going to be at the beginning. And then I'll let Matt tell you a little bit about how we figured it out. Yeah. yeah it, along those lines, it is a season one. And so we did get to have a little more, uh, you know, make some lo louder musical statements as we did in season one of The Boys. Um, or at least we were, you know, we we thought, you know, we're making sketches and we're just brainstorming, coming up, coming up with ideas. Um, um, and then palette wise, it was an interesting needle to thread because we knew we needed to feel like we were in the same world. And we also have this fresh perspective. And how do we do that? And and we know that we're we're skewing younger. And so we started making just some some rules. And we, of course ended up breaking quite a few of them but but just stuff generally like hey let, let's let's try to incorporate vocals um and you know we did we brought on a, a fantastic female vocalist uh, lauren kuliak who also goes by the artist name of katomi um more on that later i don't want to just brush past that but so we had this idea to use vocals but even then um like vocals like the literally the first sound if you listen to the soundtrack the very first sound you hear I'm looking up at the guitar that there's a, a hollow body electric guitar is me just screaming into it. And then that, but it's, it's the guitar pickups are picking it up. And then the guitar pickups are going through this, this weird tremolo, you know, I've got my, wow. uh, all our guitar pedals and stuff. So that right there is kind of a great combining of, of the two worlds. Cause that's something we would never do on the boys. Um, but when you just say, Oh, let's use vocals. Yeah. But how can we still do it in a, boy's way you know okay this this vocal is literally being captured by by guitar pickups um 
we started kind of talking about, okay, if we are going to use guitars, what if we process them like synths? Um, if we bring synths into our world, first of all, let's make sure they're analog synths so that they've got that machinery and that mechanic to it. Um, but what if we take our synths and put guitar processing on them? Um, and so that way we, we really, really, we wanted to nod to the younger kind of contemporary sound, but we absolutely did not want to ever veer like, mm. um, drawing a blank on it, but, uh, awesome that. girl or whatever. Yeah. Anyway, um, but... what's going on? Thing? Yeah. Well, we didn't want it to be like, oh, great. Here's the, here's the young contemporary, but you know, we, we want right. it to be a lot more subtle. So yeah. that was kind of our starting point. Um, and I think creatively anytime you're trying to discover something, it's always nice to push it too far. And I, I, I don't think we were, I don't think we were, we didn't think we were pushing it too far, but in hindsight, we did. We we pushed it too far away from the boys. And then as we started to mold it and get feedback and started putting it up against picture and see how stuff worked, you know, if here, here's the boys and here's where we thought Gen V should be. And then, okay, it's it's way easier to dial something back rather than to get the yeah, number. Because like, oh, in order to find that line, you have to cross it, right? You don't yeah, know where exactly. the line is, right? You exactly. have to find, oh, we are way too far. Let's Let's reel it back. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah and I think, get... and I think the other thing is too, Matt. Let me just, I mean, the other thing that after doing a show for you know three seasons, four or five years, you know, and then setting a new show in a new location with all new characters, with new ages, and like there is that obviously everyone's like, like, oh, let's do something new, and I think we we definitely did that, and I'm and we're glad we did it because I think we had to to get where we need to go, but I do think there was that you know there was that uh I, I always describe it it's there was that feeling like like in golden eye when you're like you know and 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 you're like why won't they just play the james bond theme <laughs> just play the theme man come on it's a james bond movie right yeah. like i know i get it it's it's all the sarah Sarah. it's cool yeah. and 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 it's electric but like it doesn't feel like it's part of the universe until right tank busts through and play so like i think we all you know us and eric and uh michelle our, our producer who was luckily on she was my showrunner on agent carter um you know so so we had a great relationship and i think it all got to the point where like we pushed it so different than the boys at first not complete but like pretty far and i think we're like we all were like wait we we want a little bit of the we want to feel that warmth yeah. that that like it's not maybe not a warm fuzzy feeling, but we want to feel that nasty. We want to, we want to feel like we're living in that same world because it's gratifying to as an you know as you're watching when something that reminds you that we're in this universe happens visually. You're like, oh, I I really my my ear wants to hear something warp in this way, or my ear yeah. wants to hear this kind of a of a some feedbackish kind of thing that we've done. And I think we we realize you know that. Oh, you know, personally, as fans, we wanted to feel that feeling. And so we, I think we then course corrected a little bit to get to the point where it had its own identity. And, it, and it's something we were excited about, but it definitely is, you know, it is absolutely part of the, the Vought world. And I think that, that felt that when we ended up there, we're like, oh yeah, this, this is actually what it should be. Yeah. yeah. Even, even when we course corrected, it was, it was nice that we had pushed it because we were, doing things that we would do on the boys but the sound source itself was something we would never use on the boys so like for instance go back to lauren's vocal which that's just not something that's part of the 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 boys the fabric. yeah and and but so we we have that and we're like well it's working really well but so, so okay great so we start to you know we send it through some guitar pedals and have it start to feed back on itself and then we pitch bend that and we warp that down it's like okay that's all stuff we would be doing on the boys we would just never be doing it with the vocal. But as soon as we start to kind of bring that producing side in, it it started feeling like, oh, okay, this is in the world. It, it's a different, the sound source is different. And so it feels fresh and new, but we're, we're still in this messed up world. Yeah. Well, at least you guys realize that, uh, whereas probably Eric, um, poor Eric had that done behind his back. <laughs> 
<laughs> getting that tank thing because if you listen to his original track on the actual oh, okay. soundtrack yeah. it's completely different than yeah that was a yeah he, yeah i know he, that he, was he, uh he told me on on camera too. I mean, on, on our interview, he was like, "Yeah, that was a little didn't mesh." And then they they went behind him and put that big orchestral piece in there, which it and again, like you said, Chris, it worked. Like it was needed. Like, as a fan, you want to yeah. hear it. Yeah, for sure. And I love Eric's score too. Like the rest of it, I mean, it's so iconic. And then of course, what you know, Grant and and did, you know, and Graham did for the the game is what solidified it. I think you know for the for the video game. But um, but yeah, I mean, so uh now that you have uh, this in t- I'm, I'm curious in terms of um was gen v always planned if it was going to be successful like if the boys was going to take off or did that come on the heels of like oh this show has really got its audience like let's let's try to like build it out some more like did that kind of throw you guys for a loop i'm curious in terms i guess my question is really in terms of structure like how are you given kind of the season arcs ahead of time? Do you know where the series is going? Are you like I, when I interviewed uh, Jakino, like he would talk about like for Lost, like he would just see every episode as an audience member and just react to it and then and then do that. Is that what you guys do? Or do you know what the big payoffs are going to be so you can start planting seeds? Or are you just kind of reacting episode by episode? Um, at the beginning of, of The Boys, like I, they started sending scripts and I read a bunch of them. And then by probably the second or third episode when i saw it i was like oh this is way crazier <laughs> than i thought it would then it read it didn't read necessarily the way it ended up and it was better than it read even yeah. though it read amazing but there was all this stuff that was like that you that would influence us in terms of like tone and color and darkness that you couldn't you know my imagination didn't know what that would be so but then I, the but, and that, so I, I, I stopped asking to, to read and I was like, all right, I just want to see him when we spot it. Mm. Um, and then the interesting thing came, I guess it was probably I'm trying to think what the, maybe it was the head popping and I don't know what, but it was, there was a, there was, <clears throat> there was a couple of, of, of moments where I'm like, oh, wait, I knew this was coming. And I didn't write it as shocking as it should have been because I was prepared. And so that I was like towards the end of season one, season two, beginning of season two, where I'm like, you know what? I actually want to sit and watch it for the first time with Eric because my reaction then is really what I need. I need the holy shit. I can't believe we just did that. Um, Obviously, the beginning of season three was the big holy shit moment uh with the uh, you know with the exploding penis and such but uh you know but there's been a lot of those and i i feel like it's better for us to be shocked like an audience um yeah. that I said about that yeah that's, yeah that's so I, th- I think yeah. overall we do it that way but that said there are certain things where eric will say at the beginning of a season we need to make sure that this ties up in a bow here, or we need to be able to hint at this that's going to come back in such and such an episode. And he, we won't necessarily watch it, but he'll just let us know. Um, and then the other thing, obviously, is I get a lot of a, a lot of early stuff when 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 I write songs. Mm-hmm. Some of the original songs, those ones obviously have to be recorded and 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 shot. So those ones, that's where I kind of get some of my early my early like sneak peeks. Yeah. Um, and and that's that's been really fun to be able to know that like oh to know that you know that oh my god soldier boy is gonna sing blondie you know holy <laughs> shit now i've like you know then you start realizing all of these you know other things while you produce it and that's been really fun to as a fan even to be like oh yeah. people are gonna love that or, or you know but i oh, that makes i completely forgot that it, it's your guys i mean you are the emotional vessel i think so it's like to it's your state of mind that a event essentially would kind of dictate what the score is going to be when you're writing it. So I think I never even kind of put that together, having that reaction, like, Oh, I'm going to react this and capture that emotion that I had and, you know, translate that into to music the way you guys do, which I think is, because I think somebody posted online recently, this was like, this would spur off a whole other different podcast, but he was like, how do I write happy, big emotional music if I'm, you know, feeling down today or something like that. And I forget, like, we're hu- we're humans and we have all these emotions and you have to kind of be in that certain headspace, I think, to be able to properly do it. And like, as Chris said, you're like, oh, it didn't, wasn't as shocking, you know, because if you 
already knew about it. So that's that's yeah, crazy. Yeah, Chris is the first person I've ever. That, I thought that was genius. That it was like I stopped sending us picture ahead of time because yeah. I'm I'm I can be almost overly like let me get all my ducks in a row. I'm going to do my research. I'm going to have right. it prepared. And but there is something about the show of like if you if if we have the time and the schedule to to spot it, and you know ahead of time, um, and still have plenty of time to write. But if that first viewing can be with Eric or, you know, on Gen V, you know, for us, it was with Michelle. Um, yeah, it it's it allows you to have this more visceral reaction and to, and talk exactly about what that emotion needs to be or or not be. Yeah. So uh, I'm curious in terms of a, a very kind of a show like The Boys, I'm sure. I mean, there's so much going on, so many visual effects, there's so many different stunts. And, and there's I mean, I'm sure the editing and post-production must be, you know, on par with some of these biggest, you know, you know, $200 million blockbusters. So I'm curious, as composers on a TV schedule, how do you deal with, like, when do you start spotting? And I guess, when do you start writing? Is the picture, how is the picture, cha- are picture changes equivalent to like a big action movie that you would have on, you know, and how do you deal with that, with that schedule conforming and continually trying to like, when is, when is picture locked, I guess, for you guys? <laughs> when does picture lock come on that process? <laughs> Picture's locked when it airs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would say, it, I, it, I don't know, Matt, see if you agree, but I feel like, I feel like, yes, they keep, tw- picture is, uh, Eric's always tweaking a little bit till the yeah. end. And he's very, he's just so good. And so, you know, he'll know, he'll, I mean, he'll like, it, it, there is, you know, there's been times we've been in the room, he's like, he'll, he'll just, be watching and he'll give some some notes on a cue and then he'll just turn around to the editor and be like you know what shave save seven frames off that <laughs> and then and then and then uh and then give me another uh you know give, give me a, a door you know a a, a door click yeah. pre lap cut just so we know that that's le-. and it's like but like down to the frame and and he's t- and then he does it and i'm like oh my god that is better it's totally right right he's, he's <laughs> such a pro with that stuff but at the same time nothing at this point changes drastically um it it, which which in music when you're at a tempo little changes sometimes are actually worse because then nothing hits so i mean there's definitely a lot of times where we have to conform and re and 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 change things Mm -hmm. after we've written and shown things before we, we we finally record and mix um but it's definitely not a show like when we first see the episodes like it's it's the show like it's the show and then it's just like nipping and tucking and 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 making it just just perfect but but eric's so good about what he wants every episode to do and say and the story he wants to tell and what he wants the audience to know and not know um he's very you know he'd be like he's very clear and you know he'll be quick to say you'll be like uh uh-uh, we, we don't want the audience to know x yet we don't want to know that until 33 minutes in or the beginning of the next episode or when so and so looks at somebody this way and and it's very calculated and really you know just really masterful storytelling yeah. um and and so that stuff doesn't change it's usually just like oh seven frames here and whatever and and again that still turns us into like oh now we have to make everything now we have to change everything a little bit but but it's fine yeah. because it always makes the show better yeah um, we have we have sudoku puzzles that we need to do but the emotion <laughs> the, the emotion doesn't ever change for, from the spotting session yeah absolutely so i i, I, I want to point out that the, the boys is so unique to me because it is like this uh very grounded emotional kind of you know character driven series but it it is taking on it is bringing in a lot of social commentary and it's bringing in this kind of uh it is a very very smart show and it's so well written and so well executed uh and i tell me this is fair chris i i've been i think recently i was just like it's very similar to kind of paul verhoven and the way he approaches kind of uh, satire and stuff like that and what you, know, you mentioned basil and his scores i you know recently i just kind of went on a little binge of like you know robocop and starship and like you know the way and just the way paul verhoeven approaches his version of satire and using violence or using you know social commentary about corporation or anything like that so i'm curious did you ever see any parallels like that and you know working with basil how did you learn i guess how to approach the tone of the show like i'm curious like how did you navigate that to make sure that it is you know what 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 is the boy's tone and how did you navigate all that (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, well, I think it's 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 interesting because I never really thought about that parallel, and I'm glad you brought it up. And I'm pretty sure that Eric would be flattered and probably excited about that. I'm sure you know. I I know he loves you know the yeah. soundtracks to those to Starship and, and and RoboCop and things like that. Um, and I do think that's one of the things that you know he does so well. And I got to give we got to also give credit. The reason that the show got made was because it was Eric and. Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg, who yes, I worked yeah. on Sausage Party with, and mm-hmm. and they're also masters at, you know, Eric often hides also also in comedy, but he often hides his social commentary in you know violence or um, or sort of dementia or or or, or yeah. you know or or darkness in in a lot of ways, um, and then Seth and Evan are so good at hiding gross out comedy and then you hear and you're like wait a second but what that's actually saying is this you know right. and and it's it's kind of brilliant they all do it so well they're all so smart and so smart about it um and it's cool to be on a show like that um and, and i would even say to the point of like i'm not sure how i'm not sure this show would work without it and i'm not sure how much fun it would be because like i don't necessarily want to i don't think any of us want to do a show that's just blood and guts or just yeah, yeah. sex or just humor i think the only reason it that it because it transcends like like robocop did and like starship did the only reason they transcend that is because it's you it's it's being used as a way to make people think after so you get them in the seats by being like wow it's really cool that you know butcher took b and sliced somebody at a part but then it, you realize, well, wait, it's actually commenting on his despair about losing his wife. And it's also talking about addiction and it's talking about, you know, his vulnerability. And, oh, wait a second. That's and it's talking about, oh, what happened? Did, did the corporate, you know, behemoth, did that actually feed? You know, there's all kinds of things like that where you're like, oh, my God, this is so deep. And yeah. And the crazy thing, Matt and I have said it probably for the last three seasons and and it's certainly not changing uh with gen v and and the future it's like it's almost amazing like it's almost like crystal ball the way our writers you know because they they write this a year and a half before it airs and there were so many things in season three that you're like oh my god how did they know that was gonna happen and then it happened and it's like oh my god and it's it's kind of unbelievable how and and part of me thinks it's really sad because they know it's going to happen because of course it's going to happen yeah which is crazy the the inevitable it's like the inevitable but it really like their grasp of you know of, of like current events issues politics and just being able to see I'm, you know, Eric will go, I'm pretty sure that this is what's going to happen mm. down the road. And, and, you know, and to be able to sort of like skewer it in a way that makes it not just like you're parodying it, but you're actually commenting on it. It's yeah. pretty magnificent. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. Well, I mean, if the Simpsons need some more writers, I think Eric can hit the track <laughs> to uh to yeah to predict the future matt for you was a was finding the tone of gen v was that like was that easier once you guys have to kind of built off the the sound that they have for the boys or was it tricky to find the tone for gen v uh i think it was surprisingly tricky just because we weren't we didn't want to just um uh i mean we we certainly didn't want to just turn in the same thing like sure there you go um so th- there was a lot of throwing stuff up against the wall. Um, but yeah, it was you, just, I mean, how was do you, I mean, yeah. what, oh, like, sorry, we, I was going to say the approach was still very similar yeah. in that we, yeah, formed, that's what I meant. Like we, we brought you, together you a group, a that, band yeah. oh, and we, right. we changed, you know, and we tried a lot of stuff and we did a lot of exploration early on that we showed to Eric and Michelle and, and then, even though we brought some of that, a lot of that stuff stayed. So the woods theme was like an early knockout that Matt came up with. It was like 
everyone was like, yes, that's it. And it never changed, really. I mean, we developed it in different ways, but like those kind of things were amazing. But the process was still similar. It was just like, as Matt said, the sound sources changed and maybe the way we applied certain production things to those sound sources changed uh, for this. But like, for the most part, the the idea behind how we came up yeah. with, even though it sounds different, but the way that we came up with it is a similar process. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, from from a, a blank session to to the end of a sketch is is very similar. And and Chris mentioned, you know, let's get our band together. And so I, you know, we thought like, okay, well, let's. What if we just had some fresh voices in that regard? And and that also, you know, we brought on uh, Lauren Kuliak to do s some vocals. And, you know, she was kind of a major, major part of the band. We brought on um, a experimental guitarist named Sarah Lipstate. Um, and really she, she plays with uh, she plays with the tours with Iggy Pop. Um, and so it's like, OK, this is this is a gritty electric guitar sound source, but it has a fresh take on things, a fresh voice. Um, we brought, uh, you know, Ro Rowan, which to, to do some uh, cello work, which um, on the boys, I, I actually do a majority of the cello work just because it's um, works so well that I'm a yeah. hack and we need it to be played like a hack. Um, but on Gen V, it was like, well, what if we had some of these passages played wonderfully? <laughs> um, <laughs> and so, yeah, you know, it, we say we get the band together and we still just got the band together. But but there were still some fresh voices kind of literally and figuratively there. Yeah, well, I think I mean the looking at it from like just from like point A to point B of the whole world of Du Bois and Gen V and then Diabolical as well. You guys did two episodes of that, and and uh, it's you built this sonic and musical kind of storytelling world, and I think it's so admirable and such a knockout for 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 both of you. And you know, I've been following your careers, you know, forever. So the, you guys have been able to flex your different muscles, I think, and unique muscles, and create some awesome sounds and and. And it's uh, I think the the end result is speaks for itself because the boys resonate so much with uh, so many. And I uh, just want to say congrats on that. And uh, it's been you know such a joy to see that kind of uh, I think oh, uh -oh. there's Chris is back. We're back. We're back. I just <laughs> <lost back. Chris. laughs> no, no worries. No, I was just I was just I was just praising kind of your guys of the work, uh, the work of the boys, and the, just the way this this entire musical universe kind of started. You know, it's just you look back and remember. It, for you guys it must be crazy there was a point where this none of this existed right and then it just like now it's in the world three seasons deep a new spin-off series that's going to be tying probably back into season four i'm sure and uh you know i think it was said that it was concurrently i think well i guess we'll find out you know we'll, we'll see what happens in season four but um you guys have done so much amazing work and uh, i've been it's been such an honor to to, to know you guys and, and to, to to be alongside the journey with you guys and uh um, I know we, I know as we kind of wrap up our chat for this evening, you know, we're talking about, you know, social commentary and everything. And I just, you know, our world, you know, our universe, our industry is going through one hell of a tectonic you know, shift and change and everything right now. So I'm curious, you know, both of you have been, you know, in this, in this, in this career for so long. So I'm curious, uh, what are the good things that are, are still happening you know, that are going on in our industry and what are some things that worry you that maybe we need to take a look at and maybe we should pay attention to i'm curious from your perspective well well i think i mean i was gonna say i, I think i think a lot of the concerns are are and i think that's why sag and uh writers guild did strike and struck for so long and are striking for so long and because i think there's a lot of concern that are similar between all of us because of what the technology, you know, it, yeah. when you really sit down and think, I mean, it's like, you know, was it, was it maybe 15 years ago that Netflix sent DVDs and everybody still watched network and there was no such thing as streaming. I mean, it's like yeah. not that long ago. And yeah. so there's been such a massive shift. And then you add on a pandemic, which basically clobbered the theatrical you know, movie experience and everyone got used to, and then, and, and all, meanwhile, they're making tons of shows that look bigger and cost more than movies. And they're just putting right to movies and TV, right. to right. To, um, to, to streaming. So it's, it's so different than it yeah. was 15 years ago that it just brought up all these issues. And now you have, you know, 
no one knows like what the finances that will actually work with. I mean, not, you know, I can, I can give my opinion, which is that, you know, I don't know how tenable, you know, low, you know, low subscription rate, non ad streaming is. I don't think it's, yeah. I don't think, can, I don't think it's going to work. It's not the, the numbers don't make sense. You can't make enough money to finance shows like the boys are big you know you can't do that um but then again what are people really willing to spend and how do we and i, I mean i'm a huge but like how do we get them back in the theaters how do yes. we make how do we make theater an experience that you can't get at home and vice versa because neither one's going away so right. it's like one of the things that's great about what i think has transpired in streaming that is a very good thing is that it has really brought back uh serial storytelling and world building yeah. in a way that has really created amazing like stuff that is you know that 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 that's you know in the way that serial stories like lord of the rings or or narnia or um, you know, or serial, um, uh, even even comic books, like all those things were one of the great things about those were that each it had these stories, but they weren't just weekly episodic. Where it's like at the yeah. end of the thing, you can either come back next week or not. Right. What this has done, what 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 great streaming has done, is created these big overarching multi year you know, stories where everyone's dying for the show to come back, whether it be Stranger Things or, or or Breaking Bad or whatever. And I think that's great for entertainment. I think it's it's led to amazing, amazing stuff. Um, but what it's that, what it's also done is got people really used to staying home mm -hmm. and then the pandemic didn't help either. So I think the idea is, you know, and, and, and because it's so hard to get a, you have to have such a huge hit yeah. in a movie theater to make it like worth it. You know, I, I feel like there's going to have to be, there's going to have to be something really studied in terms of like, what, what is it that makes the group viewing experience powerful? Cause it is, it, it is powerful. It is very much. Yeah. And I think, and there are so many movies and it, you know, because a lot of people talk about like, oh, well, the only one, the only movies you want to go see in a theater are, um, you know, are huge, giant spectaculars because of the the screen and stuff. And right, I don't think right. that's true. I think absolutely you want to see those in a theater. But I think, I mean, I there is no doubt in my mind that a comedy in a movie in a full movie theater is a hundred percent better. It's so awesome. No, the, better you're all laughing. Yeah. I laughing mean, together. I love going exactly. to see comedies opening night, right? like packed house. Yeah. Like it's the yeah. best. I mean, and I think same thing. I think, I mean, there's nothing like seeing a horror or a, or a oh. thriller as well. Cause yeah. when everybody jumps and you hear everyone stop breathing, like yeah. that's, that's all part of that experience. And I think there, I think if everyone really sits down and takes a look at it, there's hopefully room for, a lot and it's how do these companies that now own everything yeah. how do they how do they decide that like okay well this thing is really a movie experience and it will come with dinner and a open bar or in a bar and whatever and this one's more of a long overarching story thing so and 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 people want to keep coming back every week so that one should yeah. be on on streaming and then they go back and forth i think it's be interesting to see hopefully that there there's a world where all of that can live together um, and that'll make it more financially feasible for everybody to keep making it and make more of it and, and yeah. keep us all employed. Um, you know, and then the, the AI thing, it's just, I don't know, that one, that's, <laughs> that, that's, that's a much a, longer conversation. That's, yeah, but, that's a different sub, that's a different podcast. <laughs> but it's, it is, it is absolutely something to be concerned about, but it's yeah. also, it's also something that's n not going to be legislated out of, you're not going to be able to put the toothpaste back in that tube yep so you know i think there's 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 going to be ways that that ai can be used for good things and then there's going to be ways that it's going to you know probably create a lot of a lot of havoc and 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 i think at the end of the day though i don't i don't foresee 
I don't foresee a lot of, you know, a lot of people being okay with, you know, I don't see a lot of directors being okay with just typing a couple of words in and getting their score. Yeah. I don't think that's going to happen. I also, you know, I also think there's a legal issue with, you know, where does, where does the knowledge come from? And, and, and if it comes from somewhere that that's not public domain, how does that work? And I think that's for yeah. someone with a much higher law degree than, <laughs> than, than I know anything about. So. No, yeah. absolutely. Matt, for you, what's, what's, what are the good things? What are the bad things? Yeah, I, I was, I mean, I don't want to repeat, but I did it. It's with the strikes happening, you know, it's so many people would come up to me over and over and be like, so, so these don't really affect you at all, do they? And I just want to be like, well, no, I'm, I, I'm kind of, in a weird way, I'm getting my cake and eating it too, because I'm still working, which yes. I'm incredibly thankful for. And they're out there fighting for all the same issues that the composers are concerned about. Um, they're fighting have... for the whole industry, I think, because they're, I mean, yeah. I mean, if you want to, yeah, we, we, we I was going to say, if you want to zoom out, they're they're fighting. I mean, this is this is they're fighting because, for, yeah, because you guys uh, you guys are unique um, because you don't have a, a union which is yeah. i think another 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 just another kind of conversation but the the union and the protection that they have in, in that kind of group negotiating power i think is very important especially because yeah the corporations will always go for go for the money go for yeah. you know to whatever the that path is and i think to protect storytelling and the way it's done and for future generations is incredibly important for sure yeah, yeah because I'm, i mean yeah i see it you know i work in animation i see that side of it too you know luckily we weren't fully uh impacted uh by the strikes because we're in different you know guilds and different things like that so and i'm very fortunate to still be working too but i know so many of my friends in live action who are still unemployed still yeah. you know but you know but i think uh it's a very important, I think, time in in our industry, and uh, I I'm, I am feeling though optimistic though because seeing Oppenheimer go to almost a billion dollars is like you know what like a biopic you know but you know and you can look at like Barbenheimer as this big social media thing but you know I think it, the the storytelling spoke for itself I mean both Barbie and Oppenheimer pulled crowds in and and I went to go see Killers of the Flower Moon in, in theaters I saw it at the TCL IMAX because I was like. I'm, I support, I'm proud like that Apple is doing that. Like Apple's like, no, the Irishman went straight to streaming, but no, we're going to do a theatrical release. And then, and I think, you know, Amazon is committing to that as well. And, and Netflix doing limited, and I think hopefully Netflix will start doing longer theatrical engagements because I would love to see the killer, you know, in the theater or something like that. I know they, they just, you know, bought the Egyptian and do, are doing like a screening there, but it'd be nice to have like a few months, you know, and David Fincher film out now in the big theater. So um, but yeah, those are all amazing points. And and Chris and Matt, thank you so much for sharing all of your insight today. This was such a joy and a blast to, to talk to you guys together. And um, you know, and it was good to see you, Chris, because we haven't talked in forever. And so way was, too long. Way too long. Yeah, I know. And I still if people still I get comments every on our uh music video for Lost in Space every now and then that came edited for you. Like nice. it's people still talk about it. Like <laughs> That Which, was great. Uh, you yeah. did an amazing job. I mean, that score. That's a completely different world than The Boys. But that, again, props to that. That was like, I think one of your, your best works. I, lo I love Lost in Space. It's so good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, appreciate it. Me too. Yeah. Well, guys, uh, thank you so much. I don't want to keep you guys too long on a Sunday night, but uh, it was so great to chat. And uh, can't wait to do it in person, hopefully soon. <laughs> love it. Book it. Down. We're down with it, definitely. Yeah. Great. Thanks, right. Thanks for always, uh, always inviting us back. Yeah. Good to see you, guys.